There are several factors that influence temperature on our planet and are going to affect the temperature according to your different location. Some of these we've talked about already. For example, ocean currents. We talked about how the Gulf Stream current flows from the western side of the Atlantic Basin and brings warm water up to the British Isles. And we've also talked about how the ocean currents do an overall moderating effect on temperatures throughout our planet by taking cold waters and bringing those cold waters up towards the warmer areas and of course bringing warm waters down towards cooler areas to warm them up. So it has a moderating effect on our climate as well. The other factor that we've already taken a look at is the heating of water. With our lab, we already saw that water heats up much more slowly than land does, but it's going to hold on to that heat for a much longer period of time, and that's because water has a very high specific heat capacity. So the other factors we're going to take a look at include what is called angle of insulation. We're going to take a look at how altitude affects temperature, geographic position, and cloud cover. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what is called the angle of insulation. Now, because our planet is not flat and it has a spherical shape, when sunlight comes in, and reaches our planet, it does not always hit every location at the same angle. So as sunlight comes towards the planet, it is going to hit at a different angle. And that's going to change the intensity of that light that's coming in. And so here I've zoomed in to a location north of where the sunlight would be hitting direct and you can see that this creates a 90 degree angle with that surface versus this only creates a 45 degree angle. I kind of like to compare it to when someone is flashing a flashlight in your eyes. If someone flashes that flashlight directly into your eyeballs, it has a lot more intensity to it. But if they take that same flashlight and tilt it at an angle at your eye, now at an angle it has less intensity. It's still giving off the same amount of light. You didn't change the amount of light that the flashlight was giving off. You only changed the intensity because of the angle and the directness that that light is hitting your eyeball. We have to remember that the sun's energy doesn't change. It's not the sun that changes. It's the intensity that is going to affect climate due to the angle. So when we take this angle of insulation and combine it with the fact that we're at a tilt and then we're also moving around the sun, we get different angles of insulation at different times of the year. So the angle that the sunlight comes in on depends on your location and then what season it is. Now, keep in mind that our planet is on a tilt and we are not straight up and down from the sun um, from our pole. We are at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. So I've over-exaggerated the tilt just a little bit to make a point that the angle where the most or the location where the most direct sunlight is going to be hitting changes. So for example, when we are in this location, the most direct sunlight is going to be south of the equator. Whereas when we are at this location, it's actually going to be hitting at the equator. And so there's actually two times of the year where the equator gets the most direct sunlight. And then 
you can see that if we're in this position, the most direct sunlight is going to be north of the equator. So now I'm going to go ahead and put in the seasons that are due to different locations receiving the most direct sunlight, which means they're getting the most intense sunlight at that time of the year when they are at that position around the sun. So now you can see we are currently entering into winter. We are in our fall. So the equator is getting the most direct sunlight, but as we orbit around the sun, we are slowly reaching the point where the southern hemisphere is going to be getting the most direct light. So that means that when we are at December 21st, that's the day when we have the least intense sunlight for our location. And then as our planet continues to orbit around the sun and we approach March 20th, this location of where the most intense sunlight is at moves northward towards the equator. And so then from March 21st until June 21st, the equator is receiving the most direct sunlight, and slowly that most direct sunlight is moving north of the equator until on June 21st, that is the time when the sun's energy is going to be the most intense, the most north of the equator. And then we continue to orbit, and the cycle continues. The next factor that affects temperature is going to be the proximity to water. So land, as we saw in our lab, heats up more rapidly and to a higher temperature. So when you're in the middle of Texas here and there's no water nearby you, that land, those temperatures get very high during the day, but then they drop very rapidly at nighttime. Same thing happens in places like Arizona. If you go visit Arizona, temperatures get very warm during the day, but because there's no water to hold on to that temperature and have a moderating effect, the temperature also drops very quickly throughout the evening. And it does get very cold in the evening in desert areas because of that. So the land cools very rapidly. So what ends up happening is we have greater temperature variations over land. So Arizona throughout the day, it might get up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime, and then at nighttime it might drop all the way down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit at night. And so organisms that live there really have to deal with a very rapid change in temperature throughout just a 24-hour period. Now, if you live along the coastline, someplace over here by Florida, the water tends to have a more moderating effect on the land. And so the temperature gets up to 80 degrees throughout the day, and then it only drops down at night to maybe 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we don't see quite the rapid and large variation in temperatures because the water kind of has a moderating effect is what we call. So water has a moderating effect on the temperature. Another factor that can affect temperatures a lot are geographic positioning. And I would suggest taking a look at the graphs that are in your book to uh, give you a little bit more of comparisons. These two graphs are from your textbook, so you can see we have New York City in this graph right here, which is located on the eastern coast of the United States, and then we have Eureka, California, which is located on the opposite side of the United States. Now, first thing you should notice right away is that they have very similar latitudes. So we're not going to see an effect that's due to the intensity of sunlight or a difference in angle of insulation. Um, if we are looking at a city in Northern California versus Southern California, then we could say that the difference in temperatures could be due to the angle of insulation. But here we're looking at the fact that these two locations are at the same latitude. So what happens is we have very different temperatures throughout the year because of the water that, um, the, the wind that is blowing off of the water. 
So in the United States, winds blow from the west towards the east. So the United States is mostly affected by what are called the westerlies. And the westerlies always blow from the west. They're named according to the direction that they come from. And so you can see that Eureka over here in California has wind coming off of the oceans. And so because the water tends to have that high specific heat capacity, it's going to help to moderate those temperatures in California. Now, New York City is getting their winds off of the land. And so the land changes its temperature very quickly, as we saw in the previous slides. And because of that, the temperature of those winds are going to vary much greater throughout the seasons and create a much colder temperature during those winter months and much warmer temperatures during those summer months. Another geographic position that affects the temperatures of a location is also going to be mountains that act as barriers. And so in the image to the right, we can see that we have Seattle, Washington over here, and you can see that it's a little bit closer to the coastline. And then we have Spokane, which <clears throat> you can see that we kind of have a valley area all throughout here. There are some mountains around it, <coughs> but it's going to um, kind of be a little bit more open. And because of that openness, we see a greater temperature variation at Spokane, Washington. Whereas in Seattle here, we see that the mountains kind of act as a little bit of a barrier, kind of isolating it and keeping its temperatures from fluctuating too much. Altitude can also affect the temperature of an area. So on the red line here, we can see that we have a city on the coastline. And on the blue line here, we can see that we have another city. They're both very close to each other. They're both very close to receiving the effects of ocean waters, but yet we have some very different high temperatures. We have very different temperatures throughout the year. And so you can probably guess which one is on top of the mountain. Um, the cooler temperature is going to be at the top of the mountain. And that's going to be because as you go up with altitude, there's less molecules to be able to heat up those molecules and keep that temperature warmer. And so then you could guess that this one is at the bottom of the mountain. Cloud cover also is going to affect temperatures. Um, there is a special vocabulary word you should make note of, which is albedo. Albedo is how much radiation gets reflected by the surface. And t clouds have a very high albedo. So what that means is that clouds are going to reflect a lot of the radiation. And so during the day, if it's really sunny during the day, we can see in this image right here, clouds reflect a lot of that light back into the atmosphere. And there's only going to be very small amounts that might filter through those clouds. So most of it's going to bounce off of those clouds during the day. And so we get a cooler temperature because of those clouds having a high albedo. Now, at night, if it's cloudy during the nighttime, we've got all this heat energy that has been absorbed into the Earth's surface, and that energy is going to be being released into the atmosphere, but because the clouds have a high albedo, they're going to reflect it back to the surface, and so we're going to keep those warmer temperatures at nighttime because the clouds basically kind of trap that radiation in because of their reflective abilities. So this image here is called a um, temperature map, and we can see what are called isotherms. Isotherms are areas of the same temperature. So we can see in red that we have temperatures that are very warm near the equator. We start to cool off a little bit with the yellow as we move northerly in our latitude. And we get cooler temperatures in the green 
and then the coolest temperatures in the blue. And this all goes right along with the differences in latitude. So we have our equator going across, and so we have our warmest temperature where we have the most direct sunlight and we have that most intensity because of the angle of insulation. And so this is all going to be due to differences in latitude. So since we're talking about transfer of heat and temperature, um, we're going to talk about the different ways that heat is transferred. Conduction is one way that you might be familiar with for heat transfer. This is going to be the transfer of heat by molecular activity. So literally what happens is that the molecules collide. So in this image here we have a metal bar being heated up by the flame and the molecules that are here bang into the molecules next to it and then bang into the molecules next to it and those bang into the molecules next to it and they all start banging into each other transferring that energy from the flame through the entire metal stick until eventually if you're holding that metal stick you're going to start to burn your fingers. Now one thing with conduction and with all temperature, temperature is always going to flow from where there's a higher temperature to a lower temperature. So of course the metal over here has a much lower temperature than the metal that is right at the flame and so the energy is going to flow from where there's a high amount of energy over to where there's a lesser amount of energy. Some items that are good conductors are metal. Air is a poor conductor, so that means that the heat transfer by conduction is not the main way that heat is transferred in our atmosphere. So make sure to make yourself a note that it is not conduction that is going to be the main heat transfer within our atmosphere. We're going to look at two more methods of heat transfer. The first one we're going to talk about is convection. Convection is going to be the mass movement or circulation within a substance. You might notice this when you're boiling a pot of water um, and you might maybe you're cooking some spaghetti. When you're boiling that pot of water the spaghetti will start to circulate and move around. That's actually convection. Convection ovens also move by this or work by the same movement of air where the air heats up and rises and then the cooler air in the oven sinks down so that is a convection oven. So this is how most heat is transferred in our atmosphere and it's all because of density. We've already experienced this with our ocean currents. We know from our ocean currents that the cool water sinks down because it's more dense. Well, the same thing is going to happen within the atmosphere. Cooler air is more dense, so it's going to sink down. As it sinks down, it gets warmed up by the surface and by the solar energy that's coming in. And so then that warm air is less dense and it rises upwards. Radiation is another method of heat transfer. Um, radiation actually occurs in all directions and can travel through a vacuum, which is good because this is the method that our sun transfers heat is through radiation. All objects actually emit radiation. Um, if an object is hotter, it's going to release more radiation. If an object is cooler, it's going to release less radiation. Uh, one movie that you might be familiar with where uh, there's organisms that can actually sense the radiation that's being emitted. Uh, Predator was one of those movies where that, um, that organism could actually sense how much heat energy was being released by organisms. So organisms that have a very high amount of radiation being emitted have very short wavelengths and that's because there's lots of energy hitting the object. So you can see that if I was having a wave hit me many, many times, that's a lot more energy. So hotter objects have a very short wavelength, whereas objects that are cooler are going to have a wider wavelength. So you don't have as much energy hitting you. So this wave, it's going to be a little while until the next wave hits you. It's going to be a little while until that next wave hits you. Whereas those hot ones, you keep having a wave hitting you all of the time. 
Typically, if a material is a good absorber of radiation, it also emits it a lot. Good example of this would be um, pavement. Pavement is going to absorb a lot of energy, and then as it cools down, it's going to release that energy as well and release that heat very quickly. So it's also a good emitter of radiation.